sì. Tanto non dormo, nemmeno evitando che lo schermo. Sì, 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 va bene così. sentiva niente era perché è stato Riccardo che aveva usato il suo microfonino mm. e abbiamo realizzato dopo che se usi il tuo microfono non funziona mm, ok il cioltro il cioltro mm. sì, sì, sì sì Sì, 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 solo ora. Sì, 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 va bene, va bene. Quello come everybody. Today the speaker is Mario Ester. Mario got his PhD from University La Sapienza. Then he came to Padova to the Astronomical Observatory for his first postdoctoral fellowship. Then he moved uh, to Milano, to Innsbruck, and now he's a Global Marie Curie Fellow at the Northwestern University, Chicago, and University of Padova. Mario uh, studies uh, dynamics of clusters, uh, uh, population synthesis uh, of binary uh, stellar populations, uh, and compact objects. Thank you, Mario. So, hi everyone, and um, thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, uh, which is actually now my host. Uh, so, um, today I, I'm gonna um, give you a general overview on what I'm currently working on. Specifically, I will talk about my project, which is, which is called HOMETICS, which is the acronym for the History of Merging Compact Object Binaries. Um, this is the outline, so my plan is to um, present the context, the innovative aspects, and some very preliminary results that I obtained using the very new and, let's say, fancy methodology that I'm developing for, the, for my project, for the Homerics project. So, um, my project is... Um, has received funds from European Union through a Marie Curie Global Fellowship, and it will last until October 2021. Um, how it works in practice? Uh, well, I choose the University of Padova as my main host, but I need to spend, I have to spend the first two years of the fellowship outside European Union, and I chose Ch Chicago, Northwestern University. And then I will be back finally here for the third year in Padova, uh, working mainly with Paola, but uh, hopefully with uh, uh, most of you. So uh, for the Homerics project, I have both scientific and technological aims. From the scientific point of view, uh, the aim is to understand and to study in general the formation of compact object binaries, that is, 
uh, merging of part object binaries, that is systems that can be loud and detectable sources of gravitational waves. The final goal is to provide the theoretical interpretation for the present and forthcoming uh, gravitational wave detections. Uh, and I really would like to do that because uh, we now have 11 gravitational wave detection. 10 of them are merging binary black holes. But we still don't know much about the origin and the history of these systems. Uh, this is just to give you an updated overview of what we have now. So this plot is basically the uh, masses in the stellar graveyard. Here you have the mass in solar masses. In blue, you have the uh, black holes detected by LIGO Virgo. Purple, the black holes uh, coming from electromagnetic observations, most of them from uh, Milky Way um, X-ray binaries. Yellow, you have the known neutron stars, and here in orange, the binary neutron star detected by LIGO Virgo. So from this plot, now you, we know, we all know that binary black holes exist. They can merge within a Hubble time, but more importantly, that we know that uh, heavy stellar black holes exist. With heavy, I mean black holes with mass larger than, say, 20, 25 solar masses. Uh, we were not used to deal with such heavy black holes before the gravitational wave detections. And uh, so mm, actually 8 out of 10 um, detection, detections have at least one of the two black holes with a mass larger than 25 solar masses. So given this picture, the questions that I would like to answer for my project are how such heavy black holes form, how they can merge within a Hubble time, and uh, the history. I would like to understand the history of these objects because actually we don't know if, for example, the black holes detected by LIGO Virgo formed independently from each other, then they met maybe at some point in their life and they merged, or if the progenitor stars of such heavy black holes were bound since the beginning of their life, they evolved, died, and then merged in complete isolation. Uh, how I would like to answer this question? But, well, uh, uh, first of all, we need to study the black hole mass spectrum coming from the evolution of a population of isolated single stars. Then we need to take into account the complex physical processes that take place when two stars are in binary. And then we, we also know that most stars do not form either in isolation or in binary systems. They form in aggregates, such as star clusters. So and, and in this dense and in these dense environments, dynamical interactions take over. So it's important also to consider actually the interplay between stellar dynamics and stellar evolution. Actually, my, my project focuses more on this uh, last point. Uh, what, I, what I would like to understand is just the interplay, the importance of stellar dynamics and stellar evolution in the formation of merging compact object binaries in star clusters. Actually, um, the, the answer, I mean, this question may not be properly innovative, but my project has a little extra kick, which is the new methodology. Because we need to use, if you want, we need to use uh, population synthesis codes, which, which, I mean, codes that evolve a population of either single or binary stars until they form, they turn into compact remnants. And then we also need to use gravitational and body codes to study stellar dynamics. For the Homeric's project, I'm gonna use our new up-to-date population synthesis code, which is called seven. But more importantly, I will develop from scratch a new, a, a brand new direct and body code called HiGPU's RX. The main aim of uh, HiGPU's RX is to, let's say, bridge the gap between uh, 
uh, let's say outdated and low performance codes and the new uh, and the recent advances in physical processes, numerical <laughs> algorithms and uh, uh, computing technologies. So um, in this talk, I decided to focus more on the, this technical part, and I a uh, little bit uh, skipped this, this part of population synthesis. But in the very last part of the talk, I will also show you something that we already obtained with the, with the seven code. Uh, I will try to convince you that HiGPU's RX is a very innovative code, <coughs> and it can be a very powerful instrument not only to investigate and to study the, uh, for example, the merging black hole binaries in the context of gravitational waves, but also it would be the right tool to use for a plethora of astrophysical uh, processes and problems, all of them, for example, related to the evolution of star clusters. So um, let me start with a very simple question. So should I even care about star clusters and stellar dynamics for my project? Uh, well, in general, should we all care about star clusters? Well, the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, here are some reasons. First of all, most, we know that most stars form in clusters. And uh, as such, star clusters are very crowded systems where you can find a lot of exotic objects and at also at different evolutionary stages. So they are unique laboratories to study uh, both stellar evolution and stellar dynamics. Actually, they are unique laboratories, laboratories to study the interplay between stellar evolution and stellar dynamics because we know that star clusters are collisional systems. This means that, from the mathematical point of view, this means that the uh, relaxation time for this uh, uh, systems is less than their age. But from the practical point of view, this means that the evolution of such systems is driven by gravitational encounters between stars. And this is true for uh, star clusters of all sizes. I mean, starting from associations uh, or open clusters like this one, which is NGC 290, up to globular cluster, uh, like this one, which is M13. So the question now is how I'm going to, I'm going to study such uh, interesting systems with a very simple uh, problem, which is the n-body problem. I mean, when, when we perform an n-body simulation, we want to study the evolution of stars under their uh, and the motion of stars that are subject to their mutual gravitational interaction. And uh, this is, of course, you can recognize these formulas here. It is a very simple mathematical formulation of the n-body problem, with the acceleration, and the initial conditions in positions and velocities. But the, um, the, the find, let's say, finding a, a, both a theoretical or a, a mathematical or numerical solution to the n-body problem has always been a real challenge. The ironic fact is that uh, the mathematical formulation of the n-body problem is always as simple as it was in 1687 when, when Sir Isaac Newton formulated for the first time uh, the mathematical formalism of the n-body problem in his Principia Mathematica. But then, still now, we cannot get uh, um, uh, either a new, um, the mathematical, analytical, or a ac very accurate numerical solution of this problem. So these are some, some historical steps towards the solution, finding the solution of the n-body problem. Uh, Johann Bernoulli in 1710 uh, provided us a complete solution for the two-body problem. Uh, but finding a solution for n greater than two was a, a real challenge, and so that after uh, <coughs> 100 more than 150 years, uh, this uh, paper by Bernoulli, King Oscar II of Sweden established the prize for anyone who could provide an exact mathematical solution for the system of for the Newton's equation. Twelve papers were submitted for this competition, but none of them could find the, the, 
the exact solution. Until 1991, when a Chinese student provided an exact solution for the body problem, uh, unfortunately, um, from the, mathematic, from the mathematical point of view, this is very interesting. From the practical point of view, it's not very helpful because he provided the solution in power series, but with uh, this power series has a very slow convergence. So it's in practice is quite uh, not very helpful. So still nowadays, we need a numerical approach if we want to solve the body problem. Just a curiosity. Um, for the King Oscar Prize, uh, I mean, no one could provide a solution for the embody problem, but the prize was awarded to Henri Poincaré uh, for his studies on the restricted three-body problem. And uh, the original handwritten work by Henri Poincaré has been recently digitalized, and uh, you can download the entire uh, more than 250 pages manuscript handwritten uh, from this website. So this is uh, what I would like to show you is the first uh, numerical and body simulations ever performed. Um, was done by Holmberg in 1941. He basically he basically um, uh, n well, at that time, the computers were not very powerful. So, he, but Holmberg knew that uh, the intensity of light drops, uh, just like gravity, as r to the minus two. So he placed 74 light bulbs, uh, 30, uh, 38 per galaxy. These are two galaxies of Holmberg. And uh, he basically had a set of photocells to measure the intensity of light on the x and y axis. And then he knew the, the force to apply to each light bulb to evolve it for the next time step. So basically, this is, this is the, the result of Molberg. He wanted to show that basically spiral arms of galaxies may have originated from the collision of two galaxies. And he actually made it. I mean, it, you can find some, some kind of uh, spiral arms here. So it was very, very effective as a, an experiment. So, um, well, t today we are not at least forced to use light bulbs anymore because we have powerful computers. And we basically, if we want to solve uh, numerically then, but the problem you can choose between uh, two different approaches. The first one is to use a brute force method and the second one is to use approximate method. With the first method, also known as direct summation, you have, basically, you choose an, um, a method to solve differential equations and you apply that to the Newton's equation. In this case, um, each particle feels the force to, of the other n minus one particles. No approximation. Uh, and the, and the, comp the complexity, the computational complexity of this problem is order of n squared. In contrast, you can use an approximate method. One of the most famous methods is the tree method, where uh, each particle feels the, the, the force due to its neighbors, and more distant particles are grouped and approximated at different centers of mass. So this is just to, uh, to show you the complexity of the algorithms. Here you have these particles are approximated as centers of mass. And here you have the, for each particle you have to calculate all the distances and accelerations due to the other n minus one particle. So what methods, what, I mean, which one should we use? Well, it depends on the problem that you want to investigate. Uh, let's do some, some pros and cons. Direct and, uh, direct and body simulations are very accurate. Uh, that you get maximum resolution, but they are very slow. Approximate methods are fast, uh, but maybe not very accurate. Uh, and they are also very hard to code. The main issue uh, with our, um, if you want to study the evolution of star clusters is that we must use 
direct and body simulation with no approximation because I told you that star clusters are driven by gravitational encounters, so we want the highest possible accuracy in the numerical integration if you want to study the evolution of such crowded systems. The main issue with that is that uh, direct and body simulations are challenging. Uh, what I would like to show you here is this plot. Um, it shows the maximum number of simulated and body particles as a function of the year. And the data here, the red dots, uh, I took these red dots from, from several authors. So these are real direct and body simulations. And I also overimposed here the area of open clusters and associations uh, in terms of the number of stars, globular clusters here, and up here galaxies. So you see now that we can basically uh, uh, study the evolution of the globular clusters. But this is actually not really the case, <coughs> in my humble opinion, because if you want to evolve one single globular cluster for more than or for a relaxation time, you need months of human time and tons of uh, computing resources. So the, the main question I also would like to answer for my project from the technical point of view is, can we move forward, even a little bit forward? In my humble opinion, the answer is yes. But we need to uh, make a better use of computing resources. For example, in 2000, 2006 was a very important year because uh, graphics processing units, uh, GPUs, video card, became programmable. Uh, and in the same year, we had the um, very first direct end body codes, GPU accelerated end body code. And this code actually outperformed the end body codes of previous generations. This, is, this was just not just black magic. Uh, it's very easy to understand why GPUs are very powerful to accelerate and body simulations. Because uh, GPUs uh, are highly parallel architectures with a lot of cores, but very basic cores, with low performance per core. Um, this means that they are perfect for highly parallel tasks. Like, for example, the calculation of accelerations in an body code, because you can calculate them independently from one another. In contrast, you have central processing units, like the, the CPUs that you have on your smartphones, on your laptop, your workstation, or whatever, uh, that have uh, less cores, but the co these cores are very complex and uh, much faster than the GPU's core. So to give you, some, so they are perfect for serial, for sequential executions, for sequential calculations. Just to give you some numbers, uh, state-of-the-art GPUs have uh, 5,000 cores running at 1 gigahertz each. CPUs, 20 cores running at 3 gigahertz. So the difference is huge. So. GPUs are perfect for uh, the dynamical integration for the, for, to study subclusters I mean, through direct and body simulations. But we have not only GPUs. Uh, in 2016, so very recently, Intel company released a new set of instructions to program also CPUs. And this was basically ignored uh, by all the scientific community, more or less. Uh, but they are extremely important, extremely powerful, because just, just to give you a rough definition of what an AVX is, I mean, if you use these instructions on modern CPU, you get, basically, you can execute eight operations at a time uh, instead of just one with the same amount of time. For example, if you want to perform the, uh, you want to sum up two arrays, Instead of doing eight operations, you do it just one at the, with the same amount of time if you use these, these kind of new instructions. And these instructions are perfect to accelerate and body simulations. And the, 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 the drawback and the problem is that they are extremely hard to code and we lack uh, exhaustive documentation for such kind of instructions. 
what's why I'm telling you all these uh, uh, boring technical stuff? Because the state of the art and body codes and uh, in general and body and body plus stellar evolution codes basically do not natively support such kind of technologies. Uh, they do not natively support GPU accelerations, either GPU acceleration or AVX instructions. I mean, they run using GPUs and AVX, but through external libraries that were added on top of a machinery which was built more than 20 years ago. And of course, uh, this may uh, significantly decrease performance. And uh, moreover, not all the sections of the existing NBody codes are, uh, can run on GPUs or, or, uh, using, or, or can use AVX. So uh, the main issue was that uh, in 20 years of development, uh, not even one PhD student or postdoc was so crazy to start from scratch, rewriting or rethinking a new NBody code using such new, very fancy hardware and technologies. But I was so crazy that part of my Marie Curie project is, uh, the technical part at least of my Marie Curie project is just like this. I mean, the aim is to develop this new code, HiGPU's Rx, uh, which could bridge this gap between existing NBody codes and new computing technologies, new hardware. So these are just the, uh, the list of, uh, of my <coughs> list of my plans for the for the HiGPU's RX code. Um, I would like to port basically everything, every single section on the GPU to guarantee maximum performance, uh, and all the section that I cannot port on GPU, I can use the AVX five twelve instructions. Um, I also plan to use a new language, which is called OpenCL, so that my code will run on any computing architectures, whatever, CPUs, GPUs, Xeon file, whatever fancy stuff will come also in the near future. And I will also use the HDF5 format for effective input-output operations and ef effective data analysis. This is also very important in the context of the, the big data challenge for in, in which, of course, and body simulations are a, a great part of that. Um, of course, this, the, my scientific goal for the Marie Curie Fellowship is to use IGPUs RX to study merging compact object binaries in star clusters. But uh, what I would like to stress is that such kind of code uh, can be a crucial instrument to study also a, a plethora of astrophysical problems related to the evolution of star clusters, from associations to globular clusters. I'm very, uh, and, and to show you also this, I mean, we, I um, developed also a prototype for IGPUs RX, which is called simply IGPUs. Uh, this is basically the, uh, the ancestor of IGPUs RX, and we already used IGPUs to investigate different problems, like uh, star cluster disruption by a supermassive black hole, by a black hole binary, uh, supermassive black hole binary, rabbit mass segregation in, in star cluster, uh, nuclear <coughs> star cluster dynamics, uh, dynamical friction, and secular evolution also of uh, conical belt objects, so solar system dynamics and hopefully many more to come with the, with the new code, with the HiGPU's RX. Okay, um, so now, mm, the main issue now is that um, I spend a lot of time talking about dynamics. Uh, the problem is that if we want to use HiGPU's RX to study the evolution of star clusters, we need uh, to also take into account stellar evolution prescriptions. I mean, stars are not point-like masses. Stars have their own radius, luminosity, they evolve with time. And of course, in star clusters, stellar dynamics and stellar evolution do influence each other. So, 
the, the, the main point here is that we need to couple IGBUs Rx with a, with, a, with a stellar evolution with a population synthesis code. How can we do that? Um, we can, let's say, follow different approaches. The first one is the brute force approach. So basically, we take an advanced stellar evolution code directly from the stellar evolution community. We put that inside the IGPUs Rx code and we call it every time we uh, decide that stars deserve an update in their physical stellar parameters. Reasonable, but very slow in practice, because <coughs> especially when you deal with the evolution of massive stars, especially out, not only massive stars, but massive stars outside the main sequence, when the stellar evolution codes become extremely slow, this may be a, a, an important bottleneck for the whole simulation. So, alternatives. Well, we can always use stellar evolution code directly from the stellar evolution community, but maybe we can take them, run them separately, and with the, well, with the, with the, with the, with the data, we can maybe provide some fitting formulas for data, and use these fitting formulas, embed these fitting formulas inside the antibody code. This would be much faster. Or we can use uh, stellar evolution codes to run, a, a, to build up lookup tables where you have a set of pre-evolved stellar evolution tracks that can be given to the, to the antibody code and the antibody code can interpolate these uh, lookup tables on the fly. Both approaches are okay. Indeed, uh, the state of the art for uh, direct and body simulation plus uh, stellar evolution is uh, uh, n body 6 plus plus GPU or, an, or a, code called, a code called uh, n body 7, uh, which basically um, has a, um, is a dynamically an n body code plus a stellar evolution module, which is uh, SSC, actually BSC. Okay. Um, and this code, this uh, module here, is based on uh, fitting formulas. Um, the only, the main issue with this is that uh, BSC was, uh, and then Body 6, and uh, Body 7 were, were developed uh, um, more than 20 years ago. BSC, for example, is based on fitting formulas of stellar evolution model basically coming from 80s by Peter Eggleton. Uh, it has been updated, but the, the, the core, the fitting formulas are always, always referred to Peter Eggleton. So, and in the last 20 years, we had major changes in the stellar evolution theory. We uh, improved our knowledge of stellar winds, for example, supernova explosion, and, and a lot of other aspects. And including such major changes in a population synthesis code can be very important. Uh, especially, for example, to match, to understand the, the black holes coming from the, uh, from the gravitational, from the LIGO Virgo, the LIGO Virgo interferometers. So just to give you an example uh, of uh, how much uh, these major changes were important in the stellar evolution theory, if you download the, the, the Vanilla version of BSC from the website, and you, and, you, and you use that to run a population, uh, to evolve a population of single stars, and you want to study the, the mass spectrum of, of black hole that you get from this population, you get this plot. This is the mass of the compact remnant as a function of the initial mass of the star. Uh, these are the curves obtained with the vanilla ESC code, a different metallicity. And I also overimposed the, uh, the two black holes of the first gravitational wave detection. So you see that basically, independently on metallicity, you cannot match, the, you cannot explain the formation of such heavy black holes. Um, so this is uh, why basically in 2015, one year before the gravitational wave detection, we released a new population synthesis code, which is called SEVEN. Um, in SEVEN, basically, the aim of seven was to bridge the gap between uh, the outdated, let's say, uh, population synthesis code and the major changes in the stellar evolution theory that we had in the last 20 years. So we have 
up-to-date prescriptions for stellar evolution, supernova different and up-to-date explosion for su for su uh, sorry prescriptions for supernova explosion and so many other interesting stuff. But I have no time basically to discuss all of them because I would need a separate talk for that. But uh, just let me mention that in seven we use the lookup tables approach instead of fitting formulas. Why? Because we think this approach is much more versatile. Because, uh, for example, if you want to compare different stellar evolution prescription, you can, you can do that by simply replacing lookup tables instead of uh, fitting, again, all the stellar evolution tracks, models, the function of mass, metallicity, luminosity. So it's much easier. And um, also, just let, me, um, uh, just let me tell you that, of course, I will use seven in combination with IGPUs Rx to study merging compact object binaries in star clusters. But uh, also, seven is a, can be used as a standalone tool to investigate a plethora of astrophysical processes or problems. Like, for example, you can, um, since seven evolves a population of either single or binary stars, you can uh, produce, for example, synthetic uh, HR diagram and to com and compare this, this diagram with observations. Since we also have both single and binary stellar evolution inside seven. Uh, let, me, let me also show you, uh, since I showed you the, the, the mass spectrum <coughs> of black hole that we obtained from the, from the Vanilla version of BSE, uh, I wanted to, to conclude just showing you this plot, uh, which is the, the, the black hole mass spectrum that we obtained with the seven code. Um, so you see that basically it's very different from the, from the one I showed you before, that, uh, obtained with BSC. You see now that uh, it is of course always the same plot. Mass of the compact remnant is a function of the initial mass of the star. And different curves are for different metallicities. So you see now that we um, can form black holes up to let's say 50, 55 solar masses. Uh, and we also have some more complex features like this. For example, at some metallicity, you see that some stars leave no remnants at all. And this is because the so-called pen instability supernova, which completely destroys the star. And we can possibly form very, very massive black holes from the collapse of very, uh, let's say, monsters here. So I don't want to give you other details of this plot. I will definitely need a separate talk for that. So just let me conclude. Um, so in this talk, basically, um, I wanted to, to show you my plans for the Homerics project, at least from the technical point, part, from the technical point of view. Um, the Homerics the project, uh, project has just started three months ago, so um, hopefully in the next talk I will give you more detail about the, the code and uh, its applications. My plan is to uh, complete the development of the code within the first year so that I can use the, the, the last two years of my Mercury Fellowship to do some applications, not only related to my project, but basically, especially when I will be back here, probably uh, I, I would be happy to, to share also the code for, for, some, for some further applications. So I wanted to show you that uh, seven, uh, both seven and high GPUs RX are pillars for the Omeris project. And um, they are, of course, crucial instruments to study not only merging compact object binaries, but also other um, astrophysical <laughs> problems. During my Marie Curie Fellowship, I will also improve the seven code, especially on the binary stellar evolution part. But I will focus, especially in the first year, I will focus more on the IGPU's RX code. This is why I, I, I presented you my, my plans for the, for the IGPU's RX code. And it hopefully will be a great tool for investigating, for to investigate a lot of uh, astrophysical problems related to the evolution of star clusters. Thanks.
Thanks, Mario, for giving us this interesting overview of the uh, methodologies we can use to study star clusters and black hole formation. Uh, questions? Comments? Yes, please. Uh, well, uh, we compare the results we obtained with the seven codes using both single and binary stellar evolution with the gravitational wave observations. So uh, for now, this is only uh, the, the only one um, comparison that we made with the seven code. Um, I don't have the plot now, but we also, um, let, me, let me show you, ah, basically this one, wait. Does it work? Yes. So basically what we did so far with the seven code um, is we tried to uh, evolve a population also of binary stellar evolution of, bi of binary stars and we basically uh, made a comparison with our mass spectrum that we obtained which is in the color scale here. This is the mass of the uh, less massive object as a function of the mass of the most massive or more massive remnant at this is at high metallicity, this is at low metallicity, and these points here are the gravitational wave detection that we, uh, that we have so far. So basically what we wanted to show is that as a comparison with observations, with detections, is that we can reproduce the low mass um, gravitational wave events at basically both at high metallicity at low metallicity but we cannot match the, the heaviest, the, the gravitational wave event with the heaviest black hole at uh, high metallicity, but only at low metallicity. Marginally also this one, which is the, uh, the heaviest gravitational wave event. So this is so far what we, uh, what we, we have comparison just with the gravitational wave observations with the seven code. That was your, your <coughs> question. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, speaking frankly, um, how different is uh, this seven code with respect to the classical well known, uh, let's say, classic for people? Okay. Yeah, the, the main point with seven is that uh, Seven is a population synthesis code, fast population synthesis code. For example, we use seven to evolve 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight binary systems in one day. You cannot do that, of course, with the, with the advanced stellar evolution codes. They are much lower. They need to calculate all the internal structure of the star reaction rates and so on. But what we did with the seven code is to take the advances uh, that in, the, in the physical processes and the stellar evolution that they are implemented inside advanced stellar evolution codes like Parsec, we generated pre-evolved tracks and we put them inside seven so that seven can interpolate very fast this track and obtain and, and, and be useful for a population synthesis study. So you can get such kind of uh, comparison with the gravitational wave observations. And also, um, since seven reads a set of lookup tables, these lookup tables that we used, for example, for this paper for, to make such comparison are the parsec stellar evolution tracks. But then, uh, if you want to change uh, stellar evolution prescription, for example, you don't want to use parsec, you want to use another stellar evolution code, you can do that by simply running separately the stellar evolution code then generate lookup tables and put them inside seven. And you can obtain easily the same plot, but with different stellar evolution prescriptions. This is very important because especially in the last year when stellar evolution prescriptions change very fast, especially for winds. Please. Mass 
Yes. And that's much more determined from what uh, happens at supernova explosion. Mm -hmm. And right. there are at least two <coughs> important processes. One is the mass cut, where the uh, shock wave emerges, and the other is the fallback. Yeah. So how do you map? This is all, almost a very You're difficult right. to model. You are definitely yeah. right. So um, in seven, we include a set since because we know that the supernova explosion is extremely complex and uncertain, for example, we included several prescriptions for the supernova explosion mechanism. We took, for example, uh, three models that are based on the um, final carbon oxygen mass of the star. These models come from the Friar 2012 paper. Um, and we also implemented some uh, more sophisticated prescriptions that are based on the compactness of the star just before the supernova explosion. And um, actually these two, one is based on the compactness, one is even more sophisticated because take into account also the entropy per nucleon just outside the iron core. And so uh, since we don't know what's the, the, the right mechanism, we implemented some in, in the seven code. Um, also, um, uh, of course, and we of course provided several black hole mass spectrum when we uh, changed the supernova explosion prescription. This is very important for stellar mass up to, let's say, 30, 40 solar masses. After 40 solar masses, what we get basically from all these supernova explosion mechanisms is direct collapse of the structure with fall back equal to 100%. So yes, so basically, if I may, okay, here. So basically, if we, if we change the supernova explosion mechanism, the more, most important difference are here in this region. And then you have direct collapse basically for all the, the structure. But if you put on the first slide that you showed, the black hole mass is the masses of the gravitational wave events. I think that most of the events uh, are indeed in this. Uh, no, no. <laughs> they are the balls. The cartoon by the cartoon. <coughs> yeah, yeah, one of the very first slides, yes. Well, but yes. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, especially uh, around 20. I, I would say at, at, at 40, basically, you already have direct collapse to produce such heavy black holes. This is what we, what we get from our, um, from our simulations. For 40 solar mass black hole, you have likely a direct collapse. And this is predicted by all the supernova explosion models that we have. So far. So far that we have. <laughs> How do you treat binaries in the embodying code? <laughs> this is a very nice <laughs> question. This is another toss-up. I would need a separate I talk for that. Don't go today, but, uh, <laughs> the no, is talk. I developed also, and it's ready, a, a, a module that will be attached to the HiGPU's RX code, which is a regularized module that will take care of uh, extremely high accuracy integration, dynamical integration of binary systems. This is a very sophisticated module because um, it basically regularizes the potential of the embody problem. So it basically removes the singularity at r equal to zero from, from, from with a mathematical transformation of time. This is very sophisticated, but it's very effective because if you remove the singularity of the potential at r equal to zero, it means that you can use larger time step and um, the integration will be much more accurate and faster. So basically, just to give you an idea, if you perform this side transformation of the Hamiltonian of the two body problem, you get the equation of the harmonic oscillator, which is very easy to integrate because it's not singular. And the module, that regularizes the problem, I mean, that, that, that performs such a numerical trick has already been developed. It's called now <coughs> Tsunami. Yeah, yeah, but the, the binarity is uh, the outcome of the embody or 
Are you assuming something about binary? Both. We, we, I mean, the plan is to run simulation for star clusters containing a certain percentage of primordial, the original binaries, and then the dynamic will take over. And we'll but you've not done this? No, not yet with the high GPUs RX code, but we have done it with uh, several other codes. I mean, we know how these things uh, uh, <coughs> feel. But that's the core of the problem. Yes. That's, that's definitely the, the most important thing. That's why also, uh, from the numerical point of view, also my plan is to, um, basically, if you have uh, a certain number of primordial binaries, so, uh, you can basically integrate them in parallel. So I can do that. I mean, the model, I'm, I'm already working on this, on this <coughs> model. And since binary as binaries, I mean, the dynamical integration of binaries is extremely important. It's the real bottleneck for embody simulation. We need to speed up things when you, when you integrate binaries. And you can do that by integrating them, all of them, in parallel. And if I may comment on this, uh, we have recently um, <coughs> uh, submitted a paper about the uh, evolution of black holes uh, in star clusters uh, using a similar code, the Embolis X++ code that Mario mentioned. Yeah. This is a paper by Ugo Nicola Di Carlo and Mario Russo <coughs> involved in this study. <coughs> and uh, um, we find very interesting results, but 40%, while we know that in the star clusters, the observed version of the star clusters that we simulate, the binary fraction can be up to 78%, yeah. because these are similar to young star clusters and open clusters. And this is uh, the limitation of current codes, like Embody 6++ GPU, even if we pushed it uh, in, our, uh, in our recent paper. So if this uh, new tool by Mario is successful, we will have really a change of paradigm, because we will be able to study star clusters that are not the fake version mm -hmm. of what we observe, but at least in terms of initial binary fractions, uh, reasonably in agreement with uh, the observation. And you can also increase, of course, the number of particles that you can use for star clusters, uh, 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 given a certain percentage of primordial binaries. Other questions, comments? Well, Mario will be around uh, for this week and next week too. Uh, he's uh, in the Astronomical Observatory, yeah. second floor of uh, Al Sud. So if you want to talk to him, ask him other questions, yeah. you're very welcome to contact him. Sure, and stop by my office whenever you want. <clears throat> and then we can thank the speaker. Again.